The Hero's Journey, a Mindful Accord podcast, with your host, Rich Decker. Hello, and thank you for listening to The Hero's Journey podcast, a Mindful Accord podcast. My guest on this episode is Michelle Lee. Michelle is a women's empowerment coach and speaker. She specializes in hypnosis and emotional freedom techniques, or EFT. Michelle was a teenage mother who married young and got divorced young. When faced with being a single mother, what did she decide to do? She started a coaching business. Now, this was before the coaching business had become widely known. She is also president of the local chapter in Phoenix of the National Organization for Women. In this interview, I learned of some shocking information about the Equal Rights Amendment how it's been torn apart over the last few years, and her fight to see that change. We also discussed the special powers of hypnosis and EFT together, and how it can bring about a dramatic change in a person's life. This is the hero's journey of Michelle Lee. Enjoy. Well, thank you, Michelle. Thank you for joining us today on the Hero's Journey, a Mindful Accord podcast. Let's begin at the beginning of your journey. Can you tell us about your childhood and family? Where'd you grow up? And what's one principle that your parents instilled in you? I'm going to repeat that party. What is one principle that your parents instilled in you that you carry with you today? And how has it affected your life? Well, I grew up in a small town in Northwest Colorado um, for 16 years, a, a ranching community, a farming community. My great grandfather homesteaded uh, th- a thousand acres many years ago on the Great Divide. And so we ended up in Craig, you know, that's where my mom grew up. That's where my dad grew up. And it was a pretty cool existence. And, you know, I had, I had a good family. And the one thing that my parents instilled with within me that I carry with me today is a strong work ethic. (laughs) I'm not afraid of working hard. And, you know, I, I never worry about doing too much or, you know, probably the greatest downfall of that is, is not taking enough downtime. Um, but how that has affected my life is, you know, building a business that works, it, being able to create a life that I truly enjoy and having the work ethic and not expecting somebody else, you know, having no expectations of other people, knowing that I have the power to take care of myself. So you grew up on an actual ranch? Uh, I didn't grow up on a ranch. You know, we didn't have a ranch. We had a couple of acres. Uh, My great grandfather who homesteaded the property, a thousand acres that was outside of town. And we spent a lot of time there. So we, you know, it was a country life. I didn't belong there. (laughs) I'm more of a city girl and I absolutely did not belong around wildlife, cows, horses, chickens. I didn't belong around any of that. Gratefully, we did not have any of that on our property, but it was very much the culture there, the rodeos and all of that. So I didn't grow up that way. My parents both worked in town and, you know, we had a nice life. We had a nice house and gratefully I did not grow up on a ranch. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, like you said, the the culture influences you and what most of us now, you know, because the farms or ranches are these big corporations now, but when you're a rancher or a farmer, there are no days off. You never get a day off because the livestock or the crops don't take a day off. So there's never a day off. That's exactly true. And, you know, my parents are actually living that lifestyle now out on that property where they do grow some crops. They grow grass feed for cattle. And so they are living that life now. They actually live out on that property off the grid, so to speak. And they are living that now. And my dad absolutely loves it. They, they both absolutely love it. And um, yeah, they don't, they don't take a day off. 
Well, I grew up in Colorado as well uh, from the time I was very young till I was in my early uh, mid 20s. Now, Craig is a pretty high elevation, right? Yeah, I think so. Yes. So you were you were living that that lifestyle just kind of out out of, out in nowhere, really. <laughs> it was out in nowhere. It was this town of ten thousand people, um, Steamboat Springs, which is a a popular ski hub, was you know an, an hour's drive away. We weren't skiers, but you know lots of my fam, lots of my friends were skiers. Um, but that was the closest thing. We we were probably, I think we were about three hours away close from the nearest interstate. Wow. So for any millennials that may listen to this, when you're uh, growing up in that environment, I, I, we, we probably had early Atari, but we certainly didn't have the internet. We didn't have phones. What did you do to entertain yourself as a child? Played outside, <laughs> right? I mean, we literally, we had two acres on our property. So there were some, there were kids that, that lived outside of town around us. And, you know, we had a big field behind us that I remember playing hide and seek in with all the neighbor kids. And we would be outside for hours. So we would ride our bikes into town. I remember, you know, in my junior high years, during the summertime, riding my bike into town. And, you know, if I got to my mom's office by five o'clock, then I got a ride home. If I didn't, then I was on my own getting home. But we literally would just, you know, run around town, play outside. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no video games. Where I lived, we didn't even have cable. I had to go to my friend's house in, in town to see cable. Oh my, how did you survive? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, I, I know you didn't feel like you belong there, but I grew up in a very small town in Colorado, Castle Rock. It was small mm. then, now it's not. But I, I appreciate that small town upbringing now where you knew a lot of your neighbors and, and it was a very close community. And, you know, sometimes we'd get bored, but Hell, we were out playing all the time. We were constantly outside, whether there was a foot of snow or it was 90 degrees. We were always outside doing something. Absolutely. Absolutely. So when you're growing up there, you you knew at a young age that this is not for me. Is that correct? You know, I didn't know. I don't, I don't know that I understood then that it was not for me. You know, I felt like I just didn't belong in that space. Like, I just didn't get people who wanted to be in rodeos and get dirty. And I certainly didn't understand, you know, girls that were tomboys. And I just kind of felt like, ah, this is, this is not my game. Um, and, and I, it wasn't like I want to get out of here, anything like that. But I, I did recognize once we moved, when I was 16, we moved to the big town of Grand Junction, Colorado, which did feel totally huge. It was 10 times bigger than, than Craig. And I did like that. It was so freeing to know that there were strangers in town. It was incredible to have this experience of like, everybody doesn't know me. And I liked that. I, kn- I know, you know, you're talking about we knew everybody, everybody knew everybody in town. And, and, you know, my mom knew what I was doing long before I thought she could know what I was doing because everybody was keeping her informed. So when I moved to Grand Junction, it was, it was, um, a sense of freedom. I was like, it's nice that not everybody knows me. It wasn't until I moved to Arizona 15 years ago, and and suburb of Phoenix, where I am now, that I was that I just was like, oh yeah, this is this is where I belong. This is where I belong. I'm more of a, you know, a big town, I'm more of a city girl. So when you were a young person in those environments, what were your dreams? What did you want to be when you grew up? You know, it's so funny because at some point I remember being 
in junior high school and my best friend, she and I would just like totally talk about what we were going to do after we got out of college. And I was all about being uh, a lawyer. I wanted to be a lawyer. And, and we would talk about how she and I would share an apartment together and we'd be so rich. And um, we, there was never any talk around being married or having children. I really did have this dream of being a being a career woman. Now, being an attorney, you know, I don't know. I think that was more around pleasing my dad. That was something he, he had shared with me that he wanted to do. And he gave up on that dream. So there was a part of me at that time that wanted to wanted to fulfill his dreams. And then later, you know, it was all about psychology and getting into the psyche of people and understanding their unconscious motivations. So that's what that's what propelled me forward. You know, in my in my high school years was was really that idea of how the mind works. Your life uh, took a pretty dramatic turn at a young age. Can you tell us what happened? Uh, sure. Yeah. When I was when I was 14, I was a freshman in high school and I got pregnant. I was one of at this time in our small town. I mean, we had a high school of 400. I was one of 37 girls who were pregnant at that time. And it was it was it was an interesting um, an interesting experience because it, as I look back on it now, I can see how the adults in our lives, like the, the school officials were trying to figure out what in the world to do with all these pregnant girls, you know, so we had support groups and, um, and even, you know, I felt, I never felt like, as I shared with you, I never felt like I fit in. And, and now I understand it was far more not fitting in because we lived, it was more than just living in a rural community and not being in a big city. You know, it was just feeling so different from so many people and a desire of wanting to stand out. And, and I think, you know, a part of me, there was a part of me, I had a great childhood. My parents were great, but there was a part of me that didn't feel loved. I didn't feel loved or seen by them. And so going into high school and when an older boy took notice and I felt special and I felt loved by him. Um, and then I got pregnant. I got pregnant as a freshman. And then even with those 37 girls, you would think I would have something in common with them. But I did not. It, you know, we had pregnancy in common, but I was the one one girl in high school that chose to go through an adoption with that baby. Every every other girl, you know, kept their baby. And so that took, you know, then I became the ostracized pregnant girl. Not only was I the pregnant girl, now I was the ostracized pregnant girl being being ostracized by the other pregnant girls because I was doing something that the rest of them weren't doing and that they couldn't understand. Now, why do you think the percentage of the your high school, I mean, was it 47 or 37? 30, 37. 37 out of 400 is an extremely high percentage for teenage pregnancy. Why do you think that is or was? You know, it was... And, and pregnancy rates have gone down tremendously now in, in our teens. You know, I think it was being in in a small town and not having much of a vision. You know, I look I look back now and I think that teens who have a vision of their future of what is possible for them, and of course, there's the self worth piece. It, it, you know. Um, I think I think our teens need to know that there's that one they are worthy of love. They don't have to earn it in any way shape or form. But I do think our teens having a vision. You know, and I think in that small town in Craig, there were just a lot of kids that didn't have vision, 
beyond beyond instant gratification. And I, I don't think that's just a teen thing either. I know a lot of adults that still suffer from that. Well, that is our culture is instant <laughs> gratification, right? Even more Absolutely. so now than ever. Mm-hmm. Right. If you have, if I can't have it now, I, I don't want it. I'll go get something else. Now you felt ostracized, obviously, uh, especially because you decided to um, pursue the adoption route. How did you handle that, or or did you, or, or what did you do to deal with your emotions at that time, feeling that way? Oh, I'm trying to remember. I know that I had to go through counseling in order to go through the private adoption that I went through. So I know I was getting counseling. So I'm sure that's how I dealt with it. And and, and that's, that's it. it. You know, I think it was just a part of, I had felt like an outsider always. So it was not something I hadn't dealt with before. So it was just a part of my reality, I think. And I'm sure the counseling helped too. I don't have a lot of memory about it, honestly. Well, it was a while ago, right? Yeah. It was. It, it I, was. Oh I barely gosh. remember this morning. So I, I understand. <laughs> so how did your parents handle it? And, and what, what happened with your relationship with your parents? Well, my, my relationship with my parents was fine. You know, it was interesting how they each played their parts, um, how the experience exacerbated who they were as my parents in the first place. And I have no, you know, I have no ill feelings towards how my parents handled it. I mean, I have adult children now and, and, you know, I don't know how I would have handled it if my teen daughter was pregnant. So I did adjust how I parented to hopefully prevent that. Um, and and that never happened. So how my, my parents responded, my dad was quiet, which is what he always was. He just was, you know, it was just happening around him and, and he was allowing it. And uh, my mom's um, need to control it came out. <clears throat> and so I had the support of my parents. That's the thing. It, you know, they didn't kick me out. They didn't, they didn't do any of that. And they did support me. And actually, you know, my mom encouraged me to go through the, the adoption. And, but had I not wanted to, I wouldn't have had to, you know, I knew in my heart that that was the best choice I could make for my baby who is now 33 years old. And we have a great, great relationship. She actually lived here in Arizona for a while. Um, we met when she was 21 years old. And so, you know, my parents were exactly who they needed to be in the, in the experience. And, the experience was exactly what I needed for my, for my journey. You know, I look back and that experience played a huge role in what I do now as a women's empowerment coach. Now, when when your daughter was 21, did she seek you out or did you seek her out or both? Yeah, she had been seeking me out when she began looking for me when she was 19. And I, had waited until she was 21 to see if I could find her. And so I, you know, I went on some adoption um, find sites and she had posted two years earlier on this site. So once I Googled, I wish I could tell you what exactly I Googled. um, I found her within 15 minutes. I, I had her information within 15 minutes. Well, that is a power we didn't have uh, back then, right? (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. Did you feel guilt over the adoption route or, or through your life? Never. I never felt guilty. You know, one thing, and I think this was, this is a little bit why I felt so on the outside with my, with my peers was that I had a, I had a maturity and a wisdom that my peers didn't. 
And one thing I could look at was that I didn't think I could be that great of a mom at 15 years old. And I thought the best gift that I could give this baby would be a family that really desired a family and could handle a family, handle a baby. And so I never, ever felt guilty about that. I think I would harbor a lot more guilt um, being whatever kind of mom I would have been at 15 years old. Well, that's a good perspective, especially for a young person <laughs> to have. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I would imagine. Um, I don't know for sure, but I, I imagine some mothers or even fathers uh, have a certain amount of guilt. Like, you know, did I do the right thing? Uh, it, it's the what if question. Absolutely. I think the most selfish thing I could have done was keep her. That was that would have been the easy thing to do, honestly. I mean, when you say goodbye to your baby for is is what I knew could be forever. I can I can't imagine what that feels like. I can't even imagine. It's a death. It's truly a death. You you grieve you grieve a death. And so that was the hard decision. That was the hard decision. So you you, you gave up your child for adoption and you continued through school. Were you, were you still kind of ostracized by especially the other uh, teenage uh, moms? You know, um, th- I went into my sophomore year as, you know, a whole different person. <laughs> you know, you don't, you don't go through a pregnancy, childbirth, and giving up your, your baby and remain 15 years old. So I went into my sophomore year in Craig with a new lease. I decided I was going to join everything. You know, I joined all all the groups and, you know, I didn't feel ostracized at that point. You know, I don't think, I don't remember who had babies and who didn't. And, you know, it's not like I had a relationship with those girls anymore. What I recognized was that I wasn't interested in in what they were doing anymore. I, d- I wasn't interested in being a teen. I was joining groups and I had a lot of fun doing that. But I also recognized that there were a lot of girls that I just couldn't relate to anymore. That, you know, our perspectives and our our interests and our goals were just different. So you got out of school. What were your plans and what happened then? Well, I, before, by the time I graduated high school, um, I had a boyfriend and I was pregnant again by the time I graduated high school. And, and that is where the healing didn't happen. You know, had I done a lot more healing, got maybe some more counseling and therapy after that experience, um, maybe I would have waited to have a child. Um, but that's, you know, by the time I was graduating from C- from my high school, I was pregnant again. And so my boyfriend and I got married and we had a family. And my my vision was to go into to go to school in Grand Junction. That's where we were living and raise this child with my family. He was, he was going to school too. And, you know, a turning point, it was an interesting turning point is I was, they had a call in process to create your college schedule. And when I was creating this college schedule, I think um, my daughter was about six months old or something and it could take you hours and hours on hold creating your schedule and in that moment I thought I don't have time to do this I have a child somebody else does not get to make my schedule when I am a mother that is my number one priority And so I literally chose not to go to school. And that was a turning point was 
I, I always had a strong maternal. It's so interesting because I never planned on having children. It wasn't something I thought of. But when I found myself pregnant as a freshman, I instantly had this maternal instinct where I changed everything I ate. I, I did things that you wouldn't expect a teenager to do. And when I found myself as a mother, that maternal instinct kicked in again that I need to be with her. My number one my number one priority was being with my child, not having somebody else dictate what my schedule was. Looking back on that now, again, it was very short-sighted, right? J- just like not having a vision. And but that was it. that was a huge turning point. I did not go, I did not go to school. I did whatever I could do to be an at-home parent to to be with my daughter so I actually you know I took up working as a nanny during the day and waiting tables at night so my husband could go to school um, during the day and take care of our daughter at night now did you still have the interest in psychology and and how people work and everything did you pursue that on your own I did have that interest. Yeah, that was exactly, you know, I was going to go to college for psychology. And yes, yes. And when it really turned up, it wasn't for um, another seven years after I had my third child that uh, what really turned up was that I had such difficult childbirths with all of my children. Um, I had, I had natural childbirth that, that again was, that was the maternal instincts in me. I never, even at 15, 14 years old, when I was giving birth said I absolutely do not want any drugs at all because I didn't trust the medical system that it wouldn't affect my baby. And so, but I had very difficult, painful, traumatic births. And it was after the, um, my third child, my um, oldest son, when I was suffering from postpartum depression and um, postpartum anxiety disorder that went completely undiagnosed, my intuition kicked up. And, and this is where I, it was like this inner wisdom that said, this is wrong. This is not how women are meant to have um, meant to experience childbirth. This is not how we're supposed to bring in souls from spirit to form. This is meant to be a pleasurable experience, a joyful experience, so that we can connect more completely with our babies. And so I looked for a way, this again was before internet, but I was looking for a way to support women in having a better childbirth experience. And what I found, Rich, was was hypnobirthing, teaching women self-hypnosis to have a painless childbirth. And that's what kicked in um, when I I got trained in that, you know, hypnosis, and started teaching women and their partners how to do this And seeing the results, that's what really triggered once again, um, my interest in how the mind works. And so that's what took me into hypnotherapy, seeing women having completely painless childbirths, because one, they learned the history of pain in childbirth and how it wasn't natural. And they learned to trust their bodies and how to use their minds. And I thought, wow, if hypnosis can do that, what else can hypnosis do? And that's when I really got into the psychology piece, which a lot of psychologists still don't even recognize hypnosis. And now I can look back and see how possibly going through a psychology degree would have limited me in what I do now. And it would have limited me in what I believe to be possible, qu- quite possibly. So that's, you know, it was seven years later. I, I really focused on raising my daughter and I definitely was in survival mode for sure. 
But when I found hypnotherapy, that triggered that innate interest in how the mind works and what motivates people. So were you doing this hypnobirthing as like a, as a job or was that was that your profession at the time? Is that what you were pursuing? It was. I, I did. I started, you know, I, I've always been an entrepreneur at heart because number one, I didn't see that the, the work industry, the job industry supported me as a mother or supported me as a woman, it, you know, so I always did go into working for myself. So I did. I taught women in Colorado how to um, give birth painlessly for about a year. And watching them do that, then I went and, you know, I had to travel to Denver every other weekend for several months and got my certification in hypnosis. And do you still use the hypnosis? today? I do. I do use hypnotherapy in my practice. It was in using the hypnotherapy. I really thought I'll just, you know, the bread and butter in most hypnotherapy practices is smoking cessation um, and weight loss and smoking cessation. I rocked at people quit smoking in one session. That was my goal. I understand how the power of the mind works. And that's what I did for people. And also the weight loss, um, I looked deeper. And I remember a woman coming into me very into my office very early in my practice for weight loss. And I asked her <clears throat> when she started putting on weight. You know, it, weight hadn't always been an issue for her. And I asked her, well, was there a point in your life where, you know, you started putting on weight? And she said... That, that that happened for her when she lost her baby to SIDS. And it was in that moment working with her that I knew that I would not just be doing smoking cessation and weight loss, that I am here, that my work is here to heal and empower women, that in healing that, that grief and that wound and the shame and guilt that she felt um, would ultimately shift her weight issues because the weight was simply a symptom of the deeper of her deeper pain. Well, that's an interesting point for someone that doesn't know what hypnotherapy is. If they just know what they see when they go to a Las Vegas show or something, what is hypnotherapy it, from your, uh, if you were to explain it to me that, and I didn't know what it was. Okay. Hi hypnotherapy is actually a deep state of relaxation you know, you go into um, the alpha waves or, or deeper brain waves, and you do this twice a day anyway, at least twice a day when you're waking up and when you're falling asleep. What happens when you are when you are physically relaxed and your brain waves slow down is that you have access to your subconscious mind. And your subconscious mind is what motivates you 98% of the time. And that programming happened, your subconscious mind programming happened before the age of seven. It runs your life. You're making unconscious decisions from your subconscious 98% of the time. And when you go into a state of hypnosis, with the intent to shift your subconscious mind, that's exactly what happens, is you shift its beliefs. Because your subconscious is, is programmed to believe, is programmed to protect you. And its idea of protecting you is being comfortable. So if it ever gets uncomfortable, it seeks safety. And so hypnosis allows you to access that subconscious mind and communicate with it that it is safe to make this change. So an easy, an, an easy one is quitting smoking. And that can be done in, in a few hours in one session. Because when you smoke, whether it's been 20 years, 40 years, or six weeks, it becomes an unconscious habit. You just go pick up a cigarette. You don't even know it. You know, 
first thing in the morning, maybe you pick up a cigarette because it's a habit. So hypnosis is a highly effective and efficient way to change those habits. Hypnotherapy heals, helps heal the wounds too. So it is, it is very quick and very accurate. But I find that, you know, later on in my practice, when I really began to focus my work around women and self-love and self-worth, I found that hypnosis wasn't as fast as I wanted it to be because the wounds that women felt um, are generational. (laughs) They are so deeply embedded with our need to be loved and accepted that I began using another another modality as well. And that is called emotional freedom technique. And I've discovered that combining those two modalities accelerates accelerates one's healing and awakening. Well we'll talk about emotional freedom technique. But I think it's important what you said is that and I try to reiterate this to people is and we're all doing this we're all mostly sleepwalking through life all the time. It's it, we make decisions, we do things and we don't even know why. And it's because of that unconscious or subconscious mind. So we're all sleepwalking through life mostly. Absolutely. And and that's what I that's what I've told told people. I tell people I like my job isn't to hypnotize you. My job is to wake you up from the hypnosis you're already in. <laughs> That is that is that is right on, right? That is right on. You're already asleep. I'm trying to wake you up. <laughs> exactly. That is so true. You know, and you know, one of the biggest objections to hypnosis I hear from um, very asleep people is that I don't want to give anybody control of my mind. And you know, my friend, your mind has already been taken over. Right. You know, that's what I think about this this technology as it's evolving with the algorithms and the AI. I think that's why we all need to wake up because if you don't, you're go- I mean, you're already a puppet to a certain degree to your past conditioning. But these programs and these things are going to be manipulating you like you're a puppet. Mm-hmm. You'll be doing things. You'll buy things. You know, I don't even know why I bought that, but I bought it. You know what I mean? This is it's just going to get uh, more and more a part of our lives. So to explain emotional freedom technique emotional freedom technique is um it's a it's called energy psychology and it's being proven more and more um but it runs on the premise that we do have the energetic meridians that run through our body that acupuncturists and acupressurists use and eft is a process of tapping on those acupressure on major acupressure points major meridian points as you focus on the negative emotion. So you actually focus on the negative emotion. Say you feel um, say you feel guilty about something. Guilt and shame are huge for humanity. Um, they're the tools that have been used to control us for eons. And so um, I help people heal from that guilt and shame. And so when we focus on, even though I feel guilty for this, even though I feel guilty for that. And we we say those words as we tap on major meridian points, it actually releases the emotion from your body. Because what happens, like you just said, most people are sleepwalking through life, that our body becomes our unconscious mind. So we make quick decisions out of guilt. We make decisions out of shame. So we tap on the major meridian points focusing on the unpreferred emotion and it literally releases from the body and the mind. And that's how it works. And, and I've, I've been using this technique for 15 years and it is incredibly powerful. I have seen people heal from fibromyalgia I have seen people heal, an 80-year-old woman heal hip pain that she had since she was eight years old. All of our emotions eventually, if we hold on to those emotions long enough, will manifest in the physical body. So any physical ailments you feel have their genesis in the mind and the emotions. And so EFT actually gets to work past that. So you know, if you're angry from from 
traffic, you can use EFT to release that anger from traffic and you immediately feel better. If you want to dig deeper, which is what I do, and I developed a training course called Deeper EFT, then you actually shift your belief systems using emotional freedom technique. Because just like you said, we're sleepwalking through life because of the conditioning of our childhood. The way I use EFT, we actually release the conditioning, which are the beliefs, from our childhood that keep us sleepwalking or making decisions from our subconscious mind. So we heal that, we release and heal the wounds of our childhood. And then I use hypnosis to awaken the truth that lives within you. Make sense? Sure. Well, let's get back to your story a little bit. So you're, you're having your family, you're starting your practice. You feel like you're, I would imagine you feel it's, it's a rewarding thing you were doing. Absolutely. Loved it. Yeah. But then you had another change in your life. What, what happened then? And, and what did you decide to do from there? Oh, I had lots of changes. I mean, if you want to talk about divorce, I, I divorced four times and became a single mom four times. The last time with three children and you know, that's when I had to get serious about building my business. And that's when I had to really look at what was motivating me. It, you know, having, I wanted nothing more as a, as a young woman, when, when I first had my first baby, I wanted nothing more than to have a happy family. I just, you know, once I had kids, I just wanted more kids and I was envisioning grandchildren and growing old with one man. And you know, that just never happened. And I had to grieve that fantasy for me. And when it came to my final divorce, I really had to look at what was motivating me, what, you know, the common denominator in all of those relationships was me. And I had to really see that what I was seeking was, was love, validation. And what I really had to discover within me was my own sense of self-love. And so that was a trigger point in really trusting myself. You know, I, that's when I became really, really dedicated to one, falling in love with myself and helping other women fall in love with themselves. And as I, as I learned to love myself, I taught other women what I was learning. And as I evolved, my, my business evolved. And so, you know, maybe I'm a slow learner, right? That I had to go through that process. I just kept thinking, I'm not finding the right guy. I'm not finding the right guy. And really what it was, was, was feeling worthy within myself to be loved the way I knew in my heart was possible. So it wasn't so much the other person, it was more you. Exactly. Exactly. It all, it's always us, isn't it? <laughs> We're our worst enemies almost 99% of the time. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's very empowering, actually. Very empowering. Because if we're the problem, we're also the solution. That's very true. So, you know, the one thing I've always wondered about you, so, you know, faced with a, a situation where even though you had this practice going most single moms faced with uh, divorce and, and having to do, be on their own again, they're like, well, I got to find a job. You know, I got to, I got to, I got to feed kids. What made you, what gave you the courage or empowered you to pursue what you were pursuing? You know, I, I guess I was born with an entrepreneurial spirit and well, I know I was born with it, but the idea as an entrepreneur of getting a job, I would have rather died. And, and I don't say that lightly. I would have rather died than get a job. Um, one, I don't want to work for somebody else. I have this, I mean, I have an intense drive to do the work that my soul wants to do. And, and that's empowering women. And I knew that where I was at as this new single mom wanting to have the same standard of living that uh, my husband provided, that this was a process I had to go through to fully empower other women, right? If I couldn't do it, how could I empower them? 
And so it was with a lot of a lot of faith, Rich, honestly, because what I believed was that if I wanted this work and if I wanted to provide for my children and continue to be the mother I had been, which was the mom who picked my kids up from school, the mom who took them to school, you know, I wanted to continue that. And if I wanted that, then I felt like God wanted that for me. And I trusted that if God wanted that for me, then I could have it. So you were in the, I guess you were in the coaching field at a time when coaching wasn't as well known as it is now. How do you, how do you become a good coach for helping empower women? Well, I think, I think part of becoming a good coach is what I just exactly said too, was that I was faced with this very difficult experience of here I am a single mom and I want to be an entrepreneur. And intuitively I knew that as I tackled this, this, these circumstances in my life, that would make me a good coach. And so what makes me a good coach is my ability and my desire and my willingness to do the hard things, no matter what other people tell me. You know, I was never willing to compromise my dream, no matter how many people. And believe me, I, you know, I, I dated a lot of men and they were all ex- really excited to tell me how impossible it was for me to build a business um, during my children's school hours you know, oh, no, you've got to put 60 hours in. And I really had to shut down what everybody else told me um, and focus and and honestly give it to God, you know, and say, okay, God, you know where my clients are and you know where I am. Bring us together and show me what to do. And so my willingness to do everything that scared the crap out of me is what makes me a good coach. Um, You know, I'm the first to tell you, I do not have a coaching certification. Um, I never really planned on being a coach. It evolved into that as I was implementing my hypnotherapy and my and my EFT, you know, and using my own intuitive abilities. I'm um, claircognizant. and, And I learned that as I worked with people that I could see what was stopping them and blocking them. So yeah, I think my life experience makes me a great coach and my willingness to do whatever it takes to honor my vision and my soul's purpose also makes me a great coach. Well, clearly your certification is your life. <laughs> that's your that's your certification. There's no question. You don't, you don't have to go to school. I mean, that's the best school you can go to, right? To experience it. I know a lot of coaches with a lot of certifications that, you know, aren't great coaches either. Right. So right. yeah, it, it's really having to live it. Well, you know, when you're in that, in this area over the past several years, I've met so many coaches and I'm not criticizing anybody, but honestly, most of them, I wouldn't hire if you want to know the truth, because I don't know if you're a good, how, uh, what your, what your abilities are. I mean, just because you call yourself a coach doesn't mean that you can help other people as, as, as a coach is supposed to. That's true. I, I agree with that. A, a desire to coach people doesn't necessarily mean you're a good coach. There's, you know, and it depends on what your vision is, right? It, it, whatever your vision is, Rich, there is a coach for you. And, you know, there's a, there's, I believe every coach has clients that are for them. So whatever level that coach may be at. One thing I've learned though, is we all need a coach from time to time. (laughs) Every person does because you can't know it all and you need help sometimes and you get trapped in your own thinking. That's absolutely true. You you know, I, you know, I was a coach for a long time before I ever hired a coach. I'll be honest Mm -hmm. about that. And uh, now I will not ever be without a coach. And many times a year, I have three or four coaches, you know, for different areas of my life. But if you want to continue growing and your goals are continually expanding, if, if you're here to live life to your fullest potential, you always need a coach. I, I will never be without a coach now. Right. Even the people like are well known and famous, even like Elon Musk, right? This this great 
genius of a person. He has coaches, <laughs> right? Yeah. You bet. Yeah. So you started at Athena Rising now. How long have you been doing that? What exactly is it? And, and who are you looking for to help with that? I started Athena Rising now um, 15 years ago. Uh, I was, you know, I've been working as an entrepreneur for 20 years. And it became Athena Rising now when I really woke to that I am here to liberate women. And, and what that is, is it's, you know, my coaching and speaking, speaking um, business where I help women awaken to their power, awaken to their self-worth. And I help um, women make more money. That, that's ultimately, I work with visionary ambitious women bust through their financial glass ceiling because no matter what level at you're at financially there's another level higher and our psyche our conditioning our mindset keeps us stuck at that level and that's what i help women do is break through that level by really exploring you know where their level of self-worth is limiting them and healing that let me touch on the money thing because I know a lot of I don't know about women, but a lot of a lot of us and, and I, I suffer from this too. We have these ideas about money, and what what do you what do you you know as briefly as you can without you know spending the whole day? But how, what do you what's your approach in, in changing people's minds in regards to money? Well, my approach in changing their minds around money is understanding that we live. We truly do live on an abundant planet, an infinite planet. We have been conditioned to believe that if I have, you have not. And that people who have are evil and awful and that kind of thing. So my approach is is twofold. One, looking at the self-worth. Because no matter what level, if you if I'm working with a woman who's making five thousand dollars a month in her business and she wants to go to ten thousand, we have to um, align with her um, her worthiness to that ten thousand dollars a month and understanding that she's not somehow taking away from that. Money is freedom and money is power. We don't do anyone any favors by having less. We absolutely do not. When we have more, we can do more for people. And, it, you know, coming from a woman's point of view and as women, money has been withheld from us. I mean, we have been, we have been conditioned to believe that if you have a family, that needs to be your priority and money should not be of interest to you. And that totally disempowers us. I mean, I was that woman. I was that woman finding myself divorced and no freaking income, right? And so my standard of living dropped. So for every woman and every woman I know of struggles with this, the pursuit of money as opposed to their family and meeting the needs of their family. So addressing the beliefs around money is understanding that the more you have, the more you make possible for others. And understanding that as you pursue your dreams, you are modeling that for your family, which is a great, great gift. Now, the interesting thing about money is, is that it's the greatest story ever told because none of it's real, not really, but we all believe it. So it's just a story you tell yourselves. And, and, and what the thing about money is money gives you choices. If you don't have money, you don't have choices. So uh, I like to have choices. <laughs> I don't know about anybody else. I like to have choices. Everybody likes to have choices. That's absolutely true. Money is freedom. Absolutely. So I, I noticed, uh, I looked. I was looking at your uh, bio on, I believe it was LinkedIn, that you recently became the president of Central Phoenix. I, I, hope, I hope I'm saying this correctly. Inez Casino chapter of the National Organization of Women. How did that come about? And and I will be honest with you. At, at one time, I remember several years ago, I used to hear a lot about the National Organization of Women. I don't hear about it as much now. Could you explain that? It's the National Organization for Women. And um, yes, 
they have been around for 60 years. And for several years, we didn't hear much about feminists because honestly, a lot of a lot of women got complacent and around assuming that one, we're equal, two, we're in a pretty good place. Um, our reproductive rights are safe. And when um, our president um, was elected in 2016, that really triggered the feminist movement again. And so now is getting a lot more um getting a lot more active again. And in Arizona, it, it has struggled. I mean, we are essentially a red state and feminists are, are Democrats. So it had suffered, but with the, with the change in the administration, the National Organization for Women are beginning to be seen a lot more. And you know, I chose to become active with them because one, I've been empowering women um, through the work I do for for almost two decades now. And two, I wanted to take it on to a larger level. I I and it and I wanted to learn like how does politics play in this? And why is the Equal Rights Amendment such a hard constitutional amendment to pass you know it's been they've been fighting for it for a hundred years just about so um so i decided to become active in that and part of my work as the president of the central phoenix uh, chapter is to bring more visibility to us and be more visible in the in our community so what, when the when things were kind of dormant with the National Organization of Women, you were still doing things. I mean, I just I remember hearing about it quite a bit. I just I just didn't hear about it for years, but it's still a vibrant and 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 uh, I, I would imagine though <clears throat> the President Trump getting elected is probably the best thing that could have happened to, to now. <laughs> Absolutely, you know, it's the best thing that could happen to the feminist movement overall. I mean, a lot of other. A lot of other um, women's groups have have sprouted up. Um, National Organization for Women has been is the oldest. You know they, they have been fighting for almost sixty years for women's rights. Where do you see that going, or where do you see it now? I mean, obviously, you know, when when we were younger, we're, you and I are pretty close to the same age. You know, things were very different then, uh, and it's changed a lot. Do you still do you see? Do you see that change and do you, where do you see it going and what needs to be done? What needs to be done is we need to get the Equal Rights Amendment ratified. It, you know, the Equal Rights Amendment died in the 1980s when um, Congress put a deadline on it before that we had before we had 38 states ratified. We only had 35 states. And those those women that fought so hard for constitutional equality um, became bereft, you know, they were so disappointed that um, they stopped fighting for it for a while, actually. And so now with the new administration, it has grown new legs. And we have 37 states now that have voted yes on the e on the ERA, and we're waiting for the 38th. Um, it, there's we fought like heck for it at the state level um, last year, and we have one man that keeps the ERA bill from being um, voted on in in the Senate. And so one man is holding the fate of many, many fe feminists in Arizona. So that's our number one goal when the legislatures are back in session come January, we will be back at it. It looks like Virginia is more likely to pass it before Arizona. We don't care who passes it first. We just want all 38 states to ratify it. And then our fight will not be over. We must fight for constitutional equality because until we do, all of the laws that are put in place to protect women, um, the administration takes them away. It, you know, each state begins taking them away until we have constitutional equality. Only then will our rights be guaranteed as women. 
that seems crazy to me that we're talking about that in this day and age, that we're talking about constitutional rights for women. <laughs> it just seems, seems bizarre to me. Why, why is that even a conversation? That shouldn't even be a conversation. It shouldn't be a, con- a conversation. And what I say is where you see the greatest oppression is where the greatest power is. You know, I there is we have the laws of separation of church and state, but they they're non-existent because church is inside of our state and that is what's holding up the ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment is that our churches do not women want women to be equal because it doesn't go with their religious beliefs. And so there's a few white men that are holding on to that and keeping it from going forth, even though the majority of people believe women should be protected under the Constitution. One thing you can think about, I mean, obviously, again, it seems crazy to me that we even have to have this conversation, but eventually these old men will move on and then eventually things will change. I think it'll continue and evolve. I, I don't think... I don't think we can fully grasp, even though you hear about fake news and all this other stuff, this level of information that we all have access to. I don't think you can predict what will happen in the future. So I I just can't see it staying as it is. Can you? No, not anymore. Not anymore. It's stayed this way for a a century, right? I mean, you keep thinking the... um, the old white men will move on, but they are there are successors. And, you know, our industries, you know, honestly, our, our country is a corporation. It's owned by the corporations. And as long as women are not protected under the Constitution, they save money, right? Because they can get away with paying women less. Walmart does it all the time. They just keep taking it to court. They have more than enough money to keep winning and winning um, court cases because women are not protected under the constitution. We really have no law that, that protects women from being paid less. And so it's really a, a corporate ordeal. I mean, even here in Arizona, our our chamber of commerces do not support the ERA. Um, one for money, two because they're they're run by religious people. That that's crazy to me. I'm sorry. It just seems bizarre that we would have to have this conversation. Well, I want to ask you, what's next for Michelle? I, obviously, this this is a big fight. Is this, this is volunteer work for you, right? This is not something you're being paid for. Yeah. But is it, you feel that strongly about it. How can more women that hear this or men hear, that hear it, how can they find out more information about this, this, this battle, this fight? Absolutely. You can go to centralphoenixnow.org, spelled out. Okay. Centralphoenixnow.org. Okay, great. You have this fight coming up. What's what's next for you at this point in your life? Uh, I think your kids are grown now, or do you still have one at home? Oh, I still have a I still have one at home. He's sixteen. So, you know, what's next for me is continuing to travel around the world, sp- spread the word around the truth about money, and continuing to empower women through my programs. I do have a program, a four-week program that's called Realize Your Feminine Wealth in 30 Days, and that starts August 7th. You can find me um, at athenarisingnow.com and reach out to me that way, Michelle at Athena Rising Now. I'm always, um, you know, I teach this four-week program twice a year. So this is the second one this year. You can catch me um, on Facebook Lives, uh, Michelle Lee CH on Facebook, and speaking, speaking um, around the community and talking about um, how women, you know, can learn to embody equality. So that's actually what I'm teaching. When I'm teaching women's empowerment and helping them make more money, they're actually embodying equality. When more and more women believe themselves and know themselves to be equal at every level, then the 
the ratification of the ERA will come even more easily. We will hit a tipping point. Well, that's great. Thank you for sharing your hero's journey with us and, and sharing your story and, and what you're doing now and this this what's going on now. It, this is very, it was very enlightening for me, and I'm sure anyone that listens to it, some of them will probably be like, this is really happening? <laughs> I can't believe it, but thank you for joining us. It's my honor and pleasure, Rich. Thank you. Thank you again for listening. And please leave any comments or suggestions. We're always looking for ways to improve our show and make it the best show it can possibly be. Visit mindfulaccord.com where you can find additional episodes and you can follow our blog. We give some helpful information on mindfulness, meditation, and just ways to manage our everyday stressful lives. And most importantly, If you know of a friend or a family member that would benefit from this story, please share it with them. Until next time, I'm Rich Decker.